My name is Ashton Verdry. I'm um, at Penn State University. I was formerly affiliated with Duke Network Analysis Center, where I worked with uh, Giovanna and, and with Jim. And I was uh, previously before that at uh, UNC. For this talk, uh, I had uh, a couple different aims with it. The main one was to kind of be an uh, overview of RDS and kind of introduce some of the key challenges with it. And then hopefully kind of end with some of the current work that I'm doing to kind of push uh, it in new directions, which I think is a new, uh, which I think is the exciting thing about it. Before I start, I wanted to thank a large number of co-authors on various projects that I uh, kind of reference in here, um, including uh, several people that are in the room, um, and also thank uh, various uh, funding organizations for supporting different uh, elements of this work. So I've been very fortunate to be uh, supported. So as I said, my goal is to kind of give an overview of RDS, um, in particular focusing on kind of the idea of hidden populations, maybe why you'd want to sample them, um, talking about some of the origins and kind of applications of RDS and how uh, it can actually be used, um, and then uh, some of the major challenges with it. And if I get through all of that, I feel like that'll be uh, sufficient. Um, but I also brought a couple hours more worth of slides, if anyone wants me to continue <laughs> after that, where I've got um, a number of new directions that I'm kind of pursuing, including uh, kind of different ways to use RDS to collect more data about network structures, um, and then alternate approaches to uh, collecting network data. So if I, get to, if I get to that, that'll be great, but if not, I'm, I'm happy to end just at an overview of RDS. I like to start talking about RDS uh, in kind of a broader sense of what I view as the importance of it. And I really think that uh, at least some element of it is the kernel of kind of the future of social science research. I think as we, uh, as we st have moved beyond just looking at kind of uh, nationally representative data, there's a lot of interest in looking at the populations that are very difficult to sample. So uh, homeless individuals, people who are uh, uh, drug users and things like that. So I think uh, we have a lot more sociological and demographic interest in uh, researching these uh, hard to sample populations. And RDS provides us with pretty much the most uh, effective way of actually collecting data on those populations that I know of. Um, also, you know, this won't surprise anyone here, but uh, new analytic tools and kind of approaches and theoretical perspectives regarding the importance of social networks in our social lives and uh, likelihood of uh, contracting infections and things like that kind of require that we need uh, sort of new approaches to data. Like the atomized data perspective that you would get from random samples might not be very useful for uh, understanding people's risk of uh, contracting uh, sexually transmitted infections and things like that. And last, I think uh, declining survey participation uh, in the social sciences is really like an existential threat that is uh, not being given enough attention by uh, researchers who rely on that data. And I think RDS is probably not the solution to that, but maybe some elements of it could be uh, incorporated to uh, possibly reverse response rate trends uh, in other surveys. And speaking of those response rate trends, I found this uh, on uh, Twitter the other day and I thought it was a pretty uh, kind of illustrative point of the, this issue of declining response rates. This is from Pew, and they're uh, talking about this uh, declining response rate over time and the very positive development that they appear to have stabilized at around 9% <laughs> of the surveys that they have. So this is, uh, this is a huge issue that you know, only 9% of the people that they're contacting are actually responding to surveys. And I think that those are uh, huge, huge problems that would, uh, we should really take seriously and try and come up with new ways to solve. And I think RDS has some of them. So the general concept of hidden populations um, is that there are lots of groups that are very difficult to survey. In the US, if you want to survey households, you might uh, go to the census and they have like a register of all the households and you could pick individuals from that and you could uh, then have kind of the, net, the normal inferential properties of random uh, sampling. Um, however, there's lots of times that there isn't a kind of list that you can sample individuals from. One example is this uh, survey in uh, Malawi uh, where they were looking at this kind of slum, and the central government of Malawi does not have a list of the households in that slum to sample from. So if you want to make uh, inferences about uh, what lives are like in that slum, you need a way to actually sample people. And you can't just walk around and, and talk to them because you want to be able to kind of uh, know mo about more than just the people that were in the survey. So in a clever application, the authors in that, they took uh, aerial photos of the slum and they put a dot on every rooftop in the uh, photos, and then they've randomly sampled uh, from those dots, so they sampled these dark dots here. Um, however, there are other hidden populations uh, beyond you know, uh, slums in the developing world where you, you don't have any uh, kind of insight into where those people are. There are no houses that you can put rooftop, uh, rooftops that you can put 
uh, dots on. So these populations um, tend to be uh, unwilling to participate in surveys and uh, unavailable to be found. They're often unwilling because uh, there's a, they face a lot of stigma. So uh, uh, men who have sex with men in, in many parts of the world face uh, enormous stigma and are unwilling to participate in surveys. Um, they might not trust the researchers themselves. If you were to go in with kind of a, you know, a suit and a tie and say, I'm from the government and I uh, would like to take a survey of you, they, they're not willing to do that. Um, and then lastly, there's this issue of rarity where these populations sometimes are, are very rare as a fraction of the overall population. And so it's inefficient to take uh, a random sample and then kind of pare down till you get to uh, just the individuals that you're focused on. An example of that is like uh, a migrant group from a particular part of another country. So there are many traditional approaches to sampling these populations. Um, the, the kind of most common one, and the one that had been uh, used for the longest time, was just a convenience sample. You just walk around and you talk to whoever you could find. Or you put up a lot of flyers and whoever came into your survey center, the people that you would, uh, that you would speak to. Other ones would be you maybe sample uh, you know, a random subset of people that visit the clinic for a STI clinic or um, an HIV clinic. Um, and another approach is this kind of location-based, where, for instance, for homeless populations, you might pick a number of uh, bridges where homeless people sleep under, and you sample those locations, and you try and survey everyone there. Um, the problem with all of those approaches, though, is this question of whether we're learning about anybody more than just the people that we sampled. Um, with uh, convenient samples and clinical samples, there's no real way to, uh, sorry, with convenient samples, there's no way to make inference to a larger group. With clinical samples, you're limited to the people that attend the clinic that you can make inference to. And similarly, with uh, the location samples, you're kind of limited to uh, people that are in fixed locations, you know, certain bridges and stuff like that. Another issue is that they are often very costly um, and uh, time intensive, and they typically yield small samples. So the one that I'm most familiar with is the location-based sampling. And in general, uh, most of the studies that I've seen of location-based sampling have done uh, heroic work, but they've still typically yield samples of, of 100, maybe 50 to 150 people, um, which is often very small for a lot of our kind of analytic purposes. So what's become uh, kind of the dominant method of approaching this problem of hidden populations is respondent-driven sampling, which is uh, originally developed by sociologists um, who were interested in studying uh, populations uh, of drug users. And it's been used uh, hundreds of times since then. There's been, as I, when I recently looked, uh, there have been more than 450 funded NIH studies that employ RDS. Um, this, they have resulted in more than 800 papers, which are cited tens of thousands of times. And actually, the NIH has devoted over $180 million of funding to uh, kind of respondent-driven sampling uh, research. So if you look at the graph over time, the first paper on respondent-driven sampling was in 97. You can just see it's, the growth is, uh, is really taking off in the numbers of papers that are being published every year using RDS. So it's becoming a larger and larger proportion of kind of public health and social science research as a way of gathering data. Um, I tried to get a comparison, like it's often useful to get a, because publications in general have gone up, so it's good to get a kind of comparative case. So I was thinking within the networks literature, egocentric is a kind of normal network design that people maybe might put in the kind of abstracts and titles of their uh, papers. So I did a search of all the ones with the NIH is funded that say egocentric, and it's only 167 studies, only $42 million of research, and that's since 1990, so a good 10 years or so before. Uh, the RDS stuff. So this is a very large, very popular method of uh, collecting data. People have applied, uh, have applied RDS to a number of uh, different populations, and I think the diversity is kind of uh, an exciting and interesting area. While most of the work is focused on these kind of top groups of uh, key affected populations for HIV, like men who have sex with uh, men, uh, people who inject drugs, and commercial sex workers, um, there's been a number of other studies looking at kind of other drug users, um, victims of sexual violence, and even kind of more out there topics like jazz musicians or wheelchair users um, or vegetarians and, and vegans. So there's been a lot of uh, different research that's tried to focus on uh, collecting data on hidden populations that are not just uh, health-based, health which I think is ex an exciting area to kind of uh, continue. The most common questions that are associated with responder and sampling are, can we just collect data on this population at all? Is there a way that we can use these methods to get people into the survey? A lot of the early work on RDS really just focused on, does it yield a large sample? Does it yield a sample quickly? And generally, it kind of found that, yes, it does yield a large sample. It tends to be a little bit more quick uh, than just convenient samples, which is a, a pretty desirable property. 
the kind of second uh, most important question that's asked within RDS is what are the characteristics of this population? And overwhelmingly, people within that have focused on kind of HIV prevalence, um, syphilis prevalence, or other kind of uh, uh, health, uh, health prevalence statistics. So proportion who don't use condoms or things like that. Um, the last uh, question is, what is the size of the population? Not just the sample, but what is the size of the population overall? Are there a lot of uh, injection drug users in a given city, or, or is it a relatively small amount? Um, I'm not going to talk about this as much, but there's a whole branch of literature that's kind of being developed um, to estimate population size from RDS samples that I think is worth uh, being aware of and paying attention to. Respondent-driven sampling um, is typically described as having two components. The first component is this kind of peer referral component, and then the second component is this statistical estimation or um, weighting of cases component. In the peer referral component, the basic idea is you start with a group of people that you've uh, come into contact with, and uh, they're called the seed respondents. And you give them a number of coupons, and then they, you, you instruct them to go into the population and recruit other people. So it really is this respondent-driven idea where individuals who are respondents to your survey are actually recruiting the next set of respondents to your survey. Um, typically, you incentivize people both for recruiting uh, data, or for recruiting new participants, but also for their own participation in the survey. Um, and uh, you go until the sample size is attained. There's sort of implicit assumptions within this. Um, one is this assumption that nobody participates more than once. You wouldn't want a case where I recruit uh, Jim Moody and, and then he recruits me and then I recruit him, right? Because that would be very inefficient uh, for, for your sample. You'd end up with two people in the, in the end. Um, while that is an assumption for in the field, a lot of the statistical estimators don't make that assumption, which leads to some problems. Um, the second assumption is that the researchers pretty much lack control of the sampling process. You tell someone to go recruit the type of person that you want, um, and you have to hope that they actually uh, comply with that and comply with other elements of the recruitment instructions. Now I'm going to walk through several of the, of the different components of the RDS process. So typically, you'd start with these uh, seed individuals. You'd pick um, seven to 10 people, um, typically by convenience, um, often from uh, you know, clinics or, or populations that you know uh, the, who they are. And you, and you start talking to them, and you kind of try and identify seeds who are willing to participate in the survey and seem uh, like they'd be able to recruit other people and excited about it. Um, you typically aim for seeds that have large personal networks. Um, people who, have, who know lots of other members of the population are a, a good way to actually start getting the uh, survey started in the population. Um, and then often it's recommended that your seeds be a little bit diverse on relevant attributes. So if you were sampling injection drug users, you might want to sample people who are, uh, start with seeds who are, uh, have been injecting for a long time and ones that have been injecting for a short period of time, or ones that are in treatment um, versus formerly in treatment. Um, these kinds of uh, considerations are there. And most of this is uh, more art than science, but the, the beginning is you try and get people that are large personal networks and diverse on attributes, and you do your best. Then you distribute two to three coupons per person in the survey. So each person would be given two or three of, of this, which would be uh, an example of a coupon. This is from a project um, in uh, Myanmar where uh, the, the coupon contains information about the survey, including where the study site is, how much you'll get uh, compensated for being in the survey, what the survey is about, and things like that. Um, so you give respondents two or three often physical copies of these coupons that then you instruct them to go out and they hand to someone else in the population that they know who's not a stranger. And then those people will take those coupons back to the survey and they can then participate with because they have a coupon. And so one of the key features of the coupons is that you record um, both who you gave the coupon to and then who redeems that coupon. And that allows you to kind of track something like a social network link within that population. You know at least that uh, that coupon that you gave to someone, in theory, was given to uh, another participant directly. And so you know that person, the person who you gave it to and the person who redeemed it uh, are some way socially connected. Um, there's been some work on using non-physical coupons for uh, kind of web-based RDS. Um, it's an exciting area of research and I think uh, actually a critical one for people to pursue. I'm not going to talk about it as much, but I think uh, one of the things to know is it's a lot more challenging when you don't have a physical coupon. So I'm going to walk through an example of uh, RDS study. Um, this is from work, uh, the data that Giovanna Murley collected and a, a uh, visualization produced by Jacob Fisher. Um, so this is kind of the resultant data that you would get from an RDS. Um, typically, you start with seeds. In this case, they started with seven seeds up at the top um, there. And you, you start with these individuals. 
uh, and then they recruit the next wave of participants. So this person actually didn't recruit anyone, but that person recruited two people, um, and one of the ones, this one didn't recruit anyone. Um, and then those people, they each recruit, and so each wave of recruitment, you kind of get this like growing kind of tree structure through the network. Um, and you can see that sometimes people that uh, are sampled early on end up not recruiting anyone, um, whereas other cases they continue recruiting for a, for a long period of time. Um, the resultant data that you get from an RDS has this kind of tree-like structure. There's no cross ties between uh, the waves or anything like that. All you know is who recruited whom. And that could be a kind of critical limitation for applying network analysis tools. But I think it's actually a surmountable one. Another feature of this that's kind of embedded within this, this is from uh, female sex workers in uh, Luzhou, uh, China. And they, sex work in China is typically organized in kind of tiers of sex work. And so uh, one of the colors, I think the cyan color is high tier sex workers. And then the purple color is people that are in uh, you know, lower tier sex work. And you can see that often it's the case that people recruit individuals who are um, of the same tier as them. And actually, like, this chain is mostly middle tier sex workers, whereas this one's almost all high tier sex workers. And so those dynamics kind of play out in a lot of RDS studies. And you see that happening uh, frequently. Another example, this is from a simulated uh, RDS on a population. So I started the RDS with one of the nodes up in here. I can't remember. I think it's that one. And I uh, simulated the typical RDS kind of structure of you recruit someone, and then they recruit a few other people. And what often happens, as happened in this case, is that the RDS moves towards the center of the network. That tends to be a kind of feature of RDS that it gets, uh, that it kind of gravitates towards the center of the network. And that's kind of a mathematical consequence of um, this kind of sampling where you're more likely to be sampled if you have more ties. So that's one thing to kind of keep in mind, that it often is um, sampling more central nodes in the network. Less, uh, less frequently sampling more peripheral nodes. Another example also from Giovanna's data in, uh, in Lujo, she uh, actually was able to embed uh, geographic coordinates for people and they created the simulated network of what the social network would look like um, for that sample of RDS participants. So this is this kind of overall simulated network where there's actual, uh, actual locations are based on uh, you know, uh, physical, uh, physical places. Um, so these people are kind of south and those people are north, for instance. Um, and then they did, uh, they looked at where the RDSs uh, tended to sample if they simulated a large number of them. And you can see it's got this kind of tendency to sample um, more central parts of the network. Um, this is where the population density is and this is the residual. So it's really sampling that very central part a little bit over uh, and above what it should have been sampling uh, if it was just kind of randomly sampling uh, individuals rather than doing the link tracing approach. So I can, um, I think it's probably better if I print this out or um, maybe make it available to people, but there's a number of core RDS resources that I just wanted to point out if anyone is interested in doing their own RDS study or uh, kind of designing uh, their own research around RDS. Um, there's a manual, a, a nice website that contains various aspects of it. There's also a number of manuals for uh, kind of survey design. Um, it has a lot of protocols of kind of what steps to take for formative research. Um, kind of how to do the consent forms, how to make coupons, and things like that. So these, uh, these manuals can be very helpful. There's also a number of software packages available for RDS um, in both uh, in R, in uh, standalone software, um, in Stata. And so if you're interested in uh, kind of conducting this, uh, I think maybe this would help save you a few minutes of uh, searching on your own for, for effective sources. So respond-driven sampling has a number of assumptions built in in addition to kind of those basic operating procedures that I just described. Um, the baseline assumption, the most kind of fundamental one, is that there are individuals in the population who know one another, um, and they're, they'd be willing to refer each other into the survey. Um, if you have a population where uh, I don't want to disclose to anyone that, uh, that I'm in the population or that um, my friend's in the population, sometimes RDS doesn't work in those situations. Um, there are a number of key concepts that I'm going to review in turn. Um, with respond-driven sampling. One is this idea that there's often two interviews with each participant that you engage in. The first interview is called a primary interview where uh, you come in as a respondent, but then there's a secondary interview where after someone has recruited someone into the study, uh, they might come back in to redeem that second incentive uh, that, they might, that they might be eligible for. Um, and that can add to a lot of uh, capacity to kind of do interesting uh, kind of social network stuff that I think is uh, worthwhile to consider. Um, 
Then I'm going to talk about sort of these key concepts of bias, sampling variance, and uh, kind of error overall. Um, RDS tends to have uh, trade-offs between how biased the result is versus how variable it is. And then I'm going to talk about some of these kind of core features of RDS and assumptions about uh, respondent degree, um, that the network has bottlenecks and things like that. There are also a number of RDS estimators. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the math of all of them, um, but they all make slightly different assumptions about the network, and usually those assumptions are sub -su some subset of these things. For instance, I mentioned earlier that it's a, often in practice, the network is not sampled with replacement, but a lot of the estimators assume that it is. So there's some issues that uh, need to be kind of taken into account, and uh, I've got some overviews that I can, I can provide of those. So what happens if those assumptions are incorrect? Because they, I mean, like, not late week, it seems like to find a network of all of those things true seems so unlikely. Yes, um, the different estimators make different assumptions about, for instance, homophily being weak or things like that. Um, the population size being larger than the social network, uh, than the sample, that's often the case. Um, you're typically not doing an RDS of, uh, you know, of a population of 300 people, right? You would just try and get as many as you can with 300 people. Um, that uh, the homophily is weak, I think that assumption is overplayed a little bit in the, in the RDS literature. Um, I think a lot of cases fit the bill on most of these, and then some of them uh, get uh, like known population size. Um, that's not an issue for a lot of the RDS estimators. Um, it's only an issue for the successive sampling one, which more fully takes into account the without replacement uh, design. So some of these are not necessary for all the RDS estimators, is what I would say. So if you don't know the population size of this hard to reach population you want to study, you cannot use this method? If you don't know the population size, you can use RDS. Um, you just want to have an assumption that the population size is sufficiently larger than the sample size, um, that the sample probably doesn't exceed more than 10% of the population size. So yeah, different, uh, different estimators make different assumptions, which really uh, constrains uh, which, which case you can do RDS in. No, you don't always start with sevens. I mean, the ideal situation would be you'd start with one, I think, is the sort of the standard answer. But um, no, some studies start with 30. Um, some start with three. Uh, it really depends on, uh, this is where the, the seed selection is often more the art than the scientific part of it. Um, any other questions about that? The recommendation is to start with seven to 10. That's the recommendation from CDC, from the UNAIDS, um, and other groups. All right, so the population, uh, sorry, the primary and secondary interviews, I think, is an important kind of consideration to keep with RDS. Um, so in this case, if you started an RDS with just one seed on node A, um, and what I tried to do here is show sort of what occurs in the population, like who's recruiting whom, but also what the researcher would see in terms of who shows up at the study site each, uh, each time period. So this graph is just individuals recruiting individuals. A recruits B, later recruits C, B recruits D, et cetera. These are time periods. So person one, uh, A is time one. The recruitment to B happens between time one and two. The recruitment to D happens between time two and time four. Does that make sense as the top level? The bottom level is who comes into the survey at each time period. So first time we survey A, and that would be their primary interview. A then recruits B, B comes in, and that's their primary interview. But often what happens is A will come back in because they've successfully recruited someone. Um, and you can do a second interview with, uh, with that same person. Um, then later down the line, both C and D are recruited. And then the next step, A, who you know, we talked to a long time ago, uh, had recruited C. So they would come back in for the, pri or for the secondary incentive. And B, who recruited D, would also come back in. So you get this sort of time ordering of cases coming in and redeeming coupons that um, I think is a little bit underused in uh, both uh, for estimators of RDS, but also for addressing substantive questions. In the back. Um, well, one thing I was thinking about when you were talking about this is confidentiality. So if you're recruiting, if you're A, you recruit B, and then you come back in as A, knowing that B came into the study, now you know that B came into the study, and you know when C comes into the study. How do you address that in the IRB? Right, so that um, varies by institution. So some, uh, some institutions won't let you do secondary uh, interviews or provide secondary incentives. Um, 
and other ones do. Uh, the confidentiality is typically achieved because you know that a, you'll, tell B, uh, you'll tell A that a coupon was redeemed, not necessarily which coupon they might have distributed in the population that was redeemed. So in this case, A would be able to figure it out, right, because they only recruited one person. But that's sort of, I think, the way that it's typically dealt with, uh, that it's not disclosing the actual person that they gave the coupon to who came back. You don't say, per, the, you know, this person came back. You say, one of the people you gave the coupon to came back, I think is how it's dealt with. Other questions on that? Right. So the code is sort of how you track that uh, you gave A a coupon to say 001, and C then later comes in with coupon 001. And the inference is that, yes, uh, that was directly given to them by uh, A. But one of the questions is whether they gave it to an intermediary who then gave it to C. And it's kind of difficult to discern whether that's the case. The more common approach would be to ask A, um, about some of the attributes of the people they gave it to, and then uh, try and infer it that way. In the back. One from the other way. So the people who are in the study earlier might know like this is a long survey, and uh, how they may tell the people later like how to avoid those questions that make the survey even longer. So how would you address this degeneracy? Right, that there's some sort of effect of at what point in the survey you're, uh, you're recruited. Um, I mean, I think that's often an issue for any kind of sampling, right? That uh, if you're sampling in a population where people can tell other people about it, uh, you have that interference between cases. I don't think that's explicitly kind of uh, dealt with for, for RDS um, in general. All right, I'm going to go to the next, uh, next one. So another big issue in RDS is that uh, the resultant sample uh, estimates kind of have a lot of flaws in general. Um, in, typically, we talk about uh, the idea of kind of biasness of the, of the sample estimates. So you take a sample and you compute a mean. Um, how far away is that mean from the population mean? That's, um, that's how we think about this issue. But really, we should be thinking about it if you were to take a million samples of the same population, on average, how far away would their, uh, would their means be from the population mean? And that is this idea of bias, that if you were to take a million samples and plot the distribution of the sample means, um, it might have a central tendency that's different than the population mean. There's a related issue, though, which is if you were to take a million samples and then plot the distribution of them, how wide is, the, is that distribution? Um, and they both kind of play a role, right? They, it both matters, because if you were to pick a random point in this distribution, this kind of dash distribution here, um, you may end up being further away from the population mean than you are in random point in the bias distribution. Or perhaps um, if you had some sort of version that was slightly biased here, where the central tendency is away from the population mean, but it's actually pretty narrow, uh, narrow dispersion, um, that this, a random sample from this distribution might be closer to the population parameter than a random sample from the unbiased distribution. Uh, and I think that's a worthwhile kind of trade-off to preserve and to keep in, in your mind. A lot of the early work on RDS focused on how biased is it? And had some positive things to say about that. But later work has kind of uh, suggested that, uh, that it has very uh, highly variable results, which lead to uh, kind of problematic inferences. To continue to kind of illustrate this point, um, the typical uh, analogy is this dartboard analogy. So if you're throwing darts at a dartboard, you might have a situation where you're biased and uh, low variance. So you have uh, your darts are consistently hitting away from the uh, from the mean, um, but they're actually in a pretty consistent point. But uh, you might also have a case where your, your darts are hitting far away from the mean on average, but the kind of, they're centered around the mean um, versus other case situations where it's far away and uh, dispersed. That's obviously what you don't want. And then the ideal situation that uh, it's low variance and around the, uh, the bullseye. Um, earlier work on RDS focused on this issue of bias, but later work has suggested that the sampling variance might actually be a, a bigger issue for RDS. And I think uh, one of the key concepts to talk about with this is this idea of a design effect. A design effect is what is the variance of an RDS survey compared to the variance that you would get from a simple random survey of the population if you were to just put dots on the rooftops and then pull uh, households uh, from that population, or pull dots, uh, what would be the variance of that distribution? So this design effect is essentially 
uh, the ratio of the variances, which in a lot of ways can be thought of as equivalent to a ratio of the sample size. So if you have a design effect of two, that often means that the sample size of the RDS survey needs to be twice as large to have the sort of same statistical precision as the simple random sampling survey. And the work on this is not heartening for RDS. This is a series of uh, respond-driven samples uh, conducted in uh, Project 90, which is a large social network, and then Ad Health. These are all different variables. Um, all the binary variables in both those data sets. And they conducted simulated RDS samples on those populations and then computed the design effect of those uh, samples compared to simple random samples from the same populations. And you're seeing design effects in the 10, 20, 30 uh, range for a lot of these variables, which suggests that RDS uh, sample sizes need to be 10 times as large as a simple random sample to have the same inferential kind of uh, ability to distinguish significant differences and hypothesis tests and things like that. We care about that because uh, if you say you're a funder and you want to know, um, you see two different uh, cities that have HIV prevalence of 40% versus 60%, right, uh, from RDS surveys, and you want to dedicate uh, uh, pre prevention efforts to those two cities, you'd want to be able to know, is the one with higher uh, HIV prevalence, is that actually higher or is that, you know, or maybe is it lower? And the design effect uh, or the sampling variance suggests that perhaps those are actually equivalent, like non-distinguishable differences. Another distinction within RDS is this idea of um, estimates and parameters. It took me a while to kind of come up with this idea. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a common idea in statistics, but it took me a long time to actually understand how problematic this can be. Um, so there's this idea of estimates, like the result you get from the sample, and then there's this population parameter. And uh, this, you know, with the, bi with the mean, that makes sense that, you know, you get a sample mean and that might be different than the population parameter, but we don't often think about that with other kinds of things. Um, for instance, with sampling variance. So one issue is that RDS has high sampling variance. That's the parameter of the sampling variance. But the ability to estimate that sampling variance or how well our confidence intervals actually replicate uh, what, they, what they should be replicating in reality is uh, a very different question. And RDS results are very bad at uh, replicating the desired confidence interval. Um, so this is an example of two networks where um, this is uh, one type of person, that's another type of person. And if you were to conduct RDS samples on these networks, you would get, uh, they both have the same uh, levels of bias, but their sampling variance is hugely different. In this network here, the sampling variance is very low, and it is very similar to the random sampling variance, which is this solid line. But in this network here, the sampling variance is substantially higher. Uh, and as the sample size increases, the, you know, the estimate of the sampling variance is increasing very slowly compared to what it does in, in this network. Um, the problem is the estimate of that parameter uh, is in either network produced uh, this dotted, or the, the circles here along that line. So a lot of the RDS estimates of sampling variance are actually assuming um, this kind of network structure rather than, and not distinguishing between different types of network structure, so they can be hugely biased. That's the upshot of that. There's a similar problem for homophily estimates as well. Another key component of respondent-driven sampling is this idea of respondent degree or popularity in the network. Um, it's typically defined as how many kind of incoming ties you have, but because RDS assumes that the network, uh, the ties are all reciprocated, it's, uh, it's incoming or outgoing. And typically you measure it by asking individuals how many people you know in the population um, who've, for instance, met the population criteria, like exchanged sex for money in the past six months if you're looking at uh, commercial sex workers, or injected drugs in the last 30 days if you're looking at current uh, injection drug users. Sometimes people will uh, introduce successive restrictions to try and get a more robust estimate of this. So they might say, how many people do you know that uh, exchange sex for, for money? And then they'd say, how many people do you know that live in this city that exchange sex for money? And then how many people that have done so in the last six months? So uh, they kind of try and narrow it down a little bit to have sort of a diversity of measures on that. Um, often these degree-based measures end up as being key components of the sample weights for RDS. Um, so they're often uh, a lot of the RDS estimators use them in their uh, estimates uh, as a weight to kind of get that sample mean uh, more correct, uh, or better estimate of the sample mean. The issue that I talked about earlier where it tends to go towards the center of the network, 
The people in the center of the network tend to be uh, people with higher degree. And so RDS often weights um, people with low degree, gives them higher weights, and gives people with high degree lower weights. So you sort of have a, uh, you can sort of correct for that tendency to sample, oversample popular individuals in the network. Um, this is also from Giovanna's uh, research, but I think this gives a pretty good example of uh, how RDS degree-based weights can work. Um, this is the individual's degree, and then this is the number of times that they're sampled if you do a million RDS samples in that population. In the case where people are conforming to the RDS assumptions about r random referrals and things like that, they're pretty linear, linearly related, so that if you're more popular, you're more likely to be sampled. And then in that case, it's a good idea to use that as a, as a weight to uh, correct biases in the data. Um, but in cases where uh, basically people were recruiting in a more uh, in a more biased recruitment fashion, or like they're preferentially recruiting certain types of individuals, um, you see that that correlation kind of starts to break down a little bit, and that can be a real issue. Oh. Uh, just a quick question about that, since that is such a critical weighting piece for RDS studies. Do you know of any work that's going on to, um, so, so I work on the National HIV Behavioral Surveillance yep. Survey, and we ask this question. And we get responses from people, you know, and we, it's a cognitively hard question to answer. How many people do you know? Yes. And we're asking it from people who inject drugs. Hey, how many people do you know who've injected drugs in the past six months? And we get answers from one to 2,000. Yes. So we don't wait the data because we don't know how. But do you know of any work that is currently ongoing to try and really figure out how to ask that question so that you can get a valid network size response? Yes and no. Um, so there's some, I mean, what's typically advocated in that situation is that you like trim the weights and you kind of discard the very, or you top coat it so the very, people who say 2,000 really don't have that uh, high of a weight. Um, I think a lot of the research is now kind of moving away from degree-based weights and trying to use other approaches. So the most recent RDS uh, uh, population mean estimators tend to be using um, elements of that uh, dynamic time dynamics that I was showing with the who recruits whom at what time and um, things like that. So I think there's a little bit of movement away from it. In terms of ways to validly collect that data, I mean the standard, the standard recommendation is to collect it in that series of cascading uh, restrictions where you would say, how many people do you know overall? Okay, but of those people, how many of them are women? Of those people, how many of them live within uh, the city boundaries. How many of them have done have been engaged in sex in the last 30 days? How many have you talked to in the last 15 days? And so, trying to restrict it that way a little bit is the I think the the most common approach. Yeah, and it's just kind of going the other way. So we used to ask, you know, how many people do you know that you've seen that inject drugs, and then how many of those are female, how many of those are male? Yes. And again, just the participants, it, it's just so hard for them to. to I mean. I, I have tried, like, how many sociologists do I know? I have no idea. <laughs> like, I, I, I wouldn't know how to answer that, and I feel like uh, I think about this problem uh, regularly, so I should have an answer for that. So I think it is a really big challenge. Do you have a question, Giovanna? Uh, you know, at least there are ways within the RDS framework to uh, establish or assess the validity of this uh, network size uh, degree reports. You know, when they are coming back to you know, get the compensation uh, for their successful referral, you can ask that question again, you know, and there are some you know, that look at the consistency of the courts. At the very least, you know whether, you know, you should believe, you know, those estimates of degree, you know, more or less, you know, based uh, on whether people consistently report within one or two week uh, uh, time frame. So yeah, this is not the solution, but uh, you know, that's... Right. If anyone didn't hear, Giovanna was talking about, um, in those secondary interviews, you can uh, often re-ask the same questions. And it kind of gives you a little bit of a test retest. Um, and I think the correlations from that tend to be pretty good, like above 0.8. So um, it could be tapping into something reasonable, uh, at least in a test retest uh, measurement of it. The next thing uh, that I want to talk about is this RDS assumption about random recruitment. Um, the basic idea is that you, within RDS, the original proposed methods assume that individuals have equal likelihood of recruiting all of their friends. So if you're talking to a person who's a circle, person A, um, and they have two circle friends and one square friend, they, it doesn't matter which uh, person they're likely to recruit. They're just as likely to recruit a B or a C or a D. Um, and the, the recruitment probabilities uh, at the edge level are like one over the uh, number of edges that they have. 
Um, I divided, I inflated by three here for uh, reasons that the next slide will make clear. Um, the problem in RDS is that often we see this kind of preferential recruitment. Like if you're a circle, you're much more likely to recruit uh, circles than you are to recruit a square. There's often this kind of within uh, friendship network kind of homophily where uh, it could be because this tie is weaker and these ties are stronger, or it could be because uh, they think that these people maybe need the money more or need to get tested. There's all sorts of reasons that lead to this kind of preferential recruitment, but there's this deviation from this assumed uh, equal levels of recruitment uh, between all the cases to this uh, kind of uh, preferential recruitment where individuals are more likely to recruit certain types of other individuals. The next uh, major RDS uh, assumption is this idea of bottlenecks. Um, this uh, was assumed to matter substantially in a lot of early RDS research, and I think in practice it does matter uh, quite a bit today. Um, it's a little bit overstated, I think, in the statistical literature, but, uh, but it still, I think, can affect whether the sample can actually move uh, effectively in the population. Um, the general advice is that if you're in a situation where you have kind of two clusters and everyone is really densely connected within clusters and then there's not many ties between clusters, it's better to try and split the sample up to survey, for instance, uh, maybe if you're doing a survey in the Raleigh-Durham area, um, you might want to say, well, have one survey in uh, Raleigh and another one in Durham because there aren't that many links between them. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. People talk a lot about this. Um, the bottlenecks uh, really lead to inflation of the sampling variance. For instance, in this network, um, which doesn't have that large of a bottleneck structure. Um, this is one of the ad health networks. If you were to simulate RDS samples on it um, with a sample size of 500, that network has uh, uh, over 150 times the sampling variance of what you would do, it, what you would get if you sampled uh, 500 people by simple random sampling. So th these bottlenecks can lead to huge problems. There are a number of RDS estimators in use. I didn't want to go through kind of the nitty gritty on all of them. Um, but I'm happy to talk about them uh, uh, offline or later. Um, I know of 11 for estimating the population mean. Um, and uh, here's a list of several of them with citations that you can look up. And then here are some new ones that have been added since. Um, the general idea, most of them use that degree-based weight. Um, but a, some of these newer ones, like the Crawford one and the Burchenko one, are actually using uh, the time dynamics of recruitment to try and uh, model it as an epidem uh, epidemiological process to get better estimates. Um, there are also several estimators of the uh, sampling variance, and most of them work very poorly. Um, but a recent one that was proposed seems to be working very well. Um, it's a bootstrap procedure. So if you want to have more accurate confidence intervals, I suggest you to look up uh, this uh, uh, to look up this paper, which has associated code that you can actually calculate uh, their tree bootstraps. In general, the population mean estimators, uh, the ones that I've examined. Um, often have bias with the exception of actually doing nothing, not weighting the data at all, it tends to work pretty well. And then there's this linked ego networks approach, which is you collect data um, and you ask people to refer, uh, you ask people how many people do you know that are women in the population. If you're trying to estimate the proportion of the population that's female, um, you can incorporate that ego network information and actually get a much more valid estimate. Um, some of the other ones uh, seem to be performing even better, the Crawford estimator, that I talked about on this slide and the Burchenko one seem to perform even better. Um, the most commonly employed one is this volts hecathorn one, which is right here. Um, and this, uh, that is just the pure degree-based estimator. Um, there's a similar version called the successive sampling one, which is the same thing as volts hecathorn except it adjusts for um, uh, the without replacement assumption of RDS. And if you have a sample where the sample size is about, you know, above 20% of the population size, you should definitely consider using the success of sampling one. Um, the sampling variance, all of the ones are pretty, uh, perform very poorly. This is what, this line here is what it should be resulting in. Um, and these are several of the older estimators that have been proposed. So most of them are, are generating sampling variance that is uh, way underrepresenting what the true sampling variance is, um, estimates of sampling variance underrepresenting what the true sampling variance is, with the exception of that tree bootstrap method, which seems to be performing very well. So I think uh, RDS, uh, in some situations, uh, RDS has a lot of promises, and I think it has a lot of pitfalls right now. Currently, uh, there's a lot of hope that some of these weighting uh, procedures can generate asymptotically unbiased results. Um, but to do that, they require unrealistic assumptions about many of the social networks and about how the recruitment is unfolding in the network. 
Um, they can often be very difficult to tell whether that assumption is verified at all. Um, and that's a, a huge issue. If you're black boxing an assumption and you can't say, well, at least I know that it met the assumption, um, it's very difficult to have any confidence in your results. Um, a big issue is that these design effects in RDS tend to be very high, um, that the sampling variance of RDS is much higher than simple random sampling, which means that uh, we might need very large samples to have uh, kind of reasonable statistical inference. Um, and up until that uh, Berchenko paper, sorry, the, uh, the paper with the tree bootstrap method came out um, in uh, January, uh, variance estimators had been basically useless for RDS. So there was no real ability to put confidence intervals on things that you could have any uh, faith in. But I think that it's still uh, got a lot of hope uh, as a method going forward. Um, it gives you new data on understudied populations, which I think is valuable, even in spite of some of these issues. Um, and it's a very effective method for drawing samples. The typical RDS sample uh, is generating, I think, about 50 cases a week, which is a pretty reasonable pace of sample recruitment, for, especially for populations that are difficult to, uh, to survey. Um, and uh, I think that there's a lot to learn about networks um, within RDS that is kind of underutilized. Um, for instance, you can learn uh, a lot about the network structure. You can learn a lot about who, what types of people know other types of people. Um, and I think that that is a, a really powerful way forward for uh, surveys of um, hidden populations for which we still don't know that much about them, except that they're often at high risk of uh, contracting uh, uh, infectious disease and things like that. Excuse me. So I think I'm kind of running low on time, so I think maybe I'll just take questions. So for rare disease populations, you mean like you know certain uh, like blood cancers or something, right? That are they're rare. Okay. Um, yes. So there's only been about five papers on web-based RDS, and I can send you uh, send you them if you're interested. Um, the general recommendation is that you need far more seeds. Uh, typically, I think I can't remember. It's either 30 or 50 is the number of seeds that's used for those. Um, you get a lot more cases where it just no you know one person participates and they just they don't recruit anyone else. Um, so it, it, it tends to be less effective that way. There's also some verification issues, like how do you know that um, if, if you participate in the survey that you're not just like referring yourself, right, um, into the survey. So there's, those are some of the main challenges with that. People have started to come up with ways to do that with like IP uh, verification and stuff like that, um, but I'm not as familiar with, with that aspect of it. But that's one of the big issues is validation. Yeah, so kind of related to that, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about this you know, what RDS looks like on paper and the reality of actually implementing this. And, you know, for example, I think it's, you know, this issue of really difficult getting one of the chains to kind of, to go, like, extends beyond just rare disease cases. I mean, I study black MSM, and, you know, we have this problem of getting the group rolling, so we either expand the number of seeds to the point where, like, it's around 40, you know, instead of the 7 or 10. And we also allow them to recruit more than three people, you know, to kind of get just things going and so that we can reach our target audience, like sample. So we do that, but then it becomes an issue in when we write manuscripts and papers of, of saying, well, this is respondent-driven sampling, but we make these dis executive decisions and then we have to defend them and we get reviewers who are very angry at us because it's not what RDS looks like on paper. So just any thoughts or recommendations for like kind of how to deal with these issues, particularly in writing methods up? Right, I think there are two, uh, two considerations with, within what you're saying. One, um, there's, it doesn't look like it does on paper, and I think that that actually can be a positive thing. So someone earlier had asked, um, what about if I give the coupon to someone and then they give it to someone else and they give it to someone else? Uh, and that kind of, uh, those kind of processes, or say I just randomly bump into someone and it's not a friend of mine in the network. Um, I think some of those processes actually lead to the realistic samples working a little bit better because it's kind of like a random jump in the network. Um, so sometimes that stuff actually might be beneficial. Oftentimes it's, it's negative and I think that there's a big like, publication filter on this where we don't hear of a lot of studies that have had, because they don't get published because reviewers don't like it if they end up not using RDS. 
Um, I mean, I think the typical thing is to pivot to making it a, uh, you know, a convenient sample is the, the typical recommendation. Um, and I think, uh, so you're talking about as if it's a convenient sample, the RDS component didn't work. I mean, I think sometimes we just called it like a peer referral based recruitment system that borrows from respondent driven sampling techniques. I mean, it's, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, we're framing that, you know, it's. Right. But this, I mean, so this definitely happens that a lot of the time uh, people won't recruit other people. Um, often when you're like fielding the data, the recommendation in that case is to uh, reduce some of the burdens of like potential disclosure so that respondents, uh, you might get rid of this, uh, you know, a second interview, maybe just have a secondary in incentive re redemption. Or you get, you make the survey easier to take and people are more willing to talk about themselves within it. Or you up the incentives is the other uh, common recommendation in practice. Um, can I ask a quick follow-up yeah. having to do with um, dropping seeds out or keeping them in the analysis? If you can comment a little bit on that. Right. So one of the common recommendations, if I can go back to this. One of the common recommendations in RDS is when you're analyzing it to drop that first wave of seeds because they're biased. Um, from a statistical perspective, uh, there's no reason to do that. Like. The, the theory why you would do that is because it starts in a biased place and eventually it ends up in a less biased place. But like from a random walk mathematics perspective, like it takes a long time to get to that less biased place, so I don't think it's a good justification for dropping them. And so I don't think it's worthwhile to drop uh, seeds. But some of the estimators require uh, you use like who recruited whom, and the seeds didn't get recruited by anyone, so in those estimators you'd want to drop them, well you'd have to. Um, Often people will drop the, you know, the seeds who don't recruit anyone. Um, I think that's a reasonable strategy. First time hearing about this uh, step two method. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about what if, if you are interested in studying the networking strategy of community organizers, for example. And the, 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 uh, sub, the subject you want to study is of about network, and then you also rely on network to reach that subject. Is there more issues than what you just talked about, or I don't know what it is. Yes. <laughs> so as I said, I have other stuff that I could get to. So uh, I have a whole other presentation that I can give if you're interested. <laughs> um, that's looking at using RDS to estimate features of the social network itself. Um, in general, it depends on what features you want to estimate. I think if you want to estimate things like homophily and things like that, RDS actually might be particularly poorly suited for that because if the recruitment is biased on that, then it's going to uh, it's going to lead to kind of poor estimates of it, right? But if you want to estimate things like network clustering or things that the recruitment is unlikely to be biased on, then it, it might uh, it might actually be more efficacious for that. I think is the main the main conclusions that I have from trying to do this work a little bit. Jim? Give us a two minute hint on the structure of networks from RDS. Okay. <laughs> Using a slide from Jim Moody. <laughs> we care about uh, networks. People are embedded in different kind of network environments. All these individuals that are red, for instance, have two sexual network partners, but it's important to know um, where they are in the overall network um, because the people that are up here have a much higher risk of contracting diseases than the people that are down here, for instance. One of the things that I've done is to try and take, uh, and this is a forthcoming paper, try and take recent estimators from uh, the computer science literature and come up with an estimate of the network clustering. Network clustering is typically just defined as what, like, what proportion of people's friends are friends with each other um, versus, in this case, that's the, that person's, this person's friends are not friends with each other, whereas this person's friends are friends with each other. So trying to estimate that. And it is, excuse me, it is possible to do that. Yields relatively, uh, relatively good estimates of uh, network clustering, which I think is a, a beneficial thing. And I'll go even one step further. The, those network clustering estimates seem to be associated with uh, spread of HIV um, and other kind of infectious diseases. This is from two cities that are really close to each other, four miles apart. In, uh, in the Philippines, and this is repeated surveillance of uh, HIV prevalence in those populations. This is the percent uh, infected among male uh, injection drug users, and uh, shot up very rapidly in this city, 
And in this city, this might be a, <clears throat> a bad data point, but it didn't shoot up as rapidly or it took longer to shoot up is sort of what the evidence suggests. And in the city where it shot up very rapidly and stayed high, it has much higher network clustering than the city where it didn't uh, shoot up as rapidly. So I think there's interesting directions we can go from there. And there's some special data you have to collect along the way to make that estimate? Yes. <laughs> you have to ask people. If you do two interviews, you have to ask them, does the person who gave you your coupon uh, know the person who you gave your coupon to? Um, or if you just do a, a primary interview, another way of approaching this is to ask them what proportion of the people, uh, what proportion of the people you know are known by the person who gave you your coupon. Um, and this one works a little bit better than this one. Thank you. So much. Thank you.